you did fairly well on the team question. I think a few teams struggled. There was one team that got a perfect score. I can't remember which one, like team three or something. I don't know, one of the teams. So um, do y'all need one more question or not? One more. What I'm thinking but it's be a lot of grading for me. But what I was thinking is not do a team question on Thursday, but have everybody provide an individual answer and your team question depends on how your team did. Because that would give me an indication who's in really bad shape. Um, it always amazes me in my classes. I graded a, a class this last week. And I begged students who hadn't had me before, come by and show me your essays before the exam. And the people that did had great essays already, so they didn't really need to show them. And they all did great. The ones who didn't, some of them had the wrong answer to the wrong question or the right answer to the wrong question. So it's, I get the impression there's some students that's like, I'm not listening to everything, you, anything you're saying at 11.59, 59 p.m. the night before the exam, I'll, that's when I'll start thinking about it. It's like, it's a horrible way to do college. Because the purpose of college is not to get grades, it's to learn the material. And you really want to sink. If I were you, I'd be desperate to learn this stuff. So I'm trying to get students, like, be prepared before the exam, not because of the exam, but because you got to get it for interviews and other things. So I'll think about it. If we do it, though, be ready to do individual, which means I got to grade, I got to grade 30 things instead of seven things. So it'd be tough. But, but we give you some insight on if I did that with someone volunteer for me to grade theirs in the class. Luke, well, all right. So y'all remember it. We'll see. I've got one I can give you. Give to you. I love the question. It really is. It shows if you're really, really understanding this stuff. I know it feels real picky, like, oh, you need two things on the treasuries. No, that's how finance thinks. This isn't Professor Sweet. Finance is treasuries are high quality and they got a duration. That's what you think about with treasuries. Oh, corporates. They're different qualities, different durations, different tax statuses. That's the way we think. We know it's, so I'm not telling you, here's the three things to learn from Professor Sweet. Those three things are the way finance thinks. If I could show you Western assets, the way they do things, you'd say it's exactly how we do it in this class. So I'm not making this stuff up. So I want y'all to be successful, but you do have to do more than just prep like it's a multiple choice exam. You have to actually learn the material, which is pretty important. All right, let's finish up asset execution. Before we do that, last class, we we're talking about how GM really messed up the indice when it went insolvent. And so this article, right after class, I saw this article. So GM went from investment grade to investment grade, below investment grade. So it went from the investment grade indice for bonds, to the junk bond indice. It was huge. Where they're saying, forget GM, forget Ford. Boeing was going to be the biggest, big, biggest ever. Y'all know what a fallen angel is? From what credit rating to what credit rating do you think? Fallen angel. It is not A to B, but it's that kind of drop. What's what's the cutoff point? When do you become junk? Double double B. So you're getting cut from triple B to double B. That's what happened to GM, although you, you can go from triple B to single C if something happened. You think about Enron. Enron, you know, Enron was double A rated the year they went insolvent. And then they got downgraded to the D, the default. And S&P, they, S&P's no, it's going to say no one was ever been double A AA or triple A rated when they went in default. And that's true because they cut the ratings like two weeks earlier. But they were double A just a few months before. That's a fallen angel to go from double A to junk overnight. So Boeing would be the biggest, if cut to junk, Boeing will be the biggest US corporate borrower to ever be struck up with investment grade ratings. And right there, what we're talking about, join the junk bond indice, flooding the high yield market record volume on new bet. This is huge. Because you as a junk bond investors, you gotta say, okay, the biggest, the business security in our index just join us overnight and I don't have any of it. So now what I do, do I have to go out and buy a bunch of it? It's it's a huge issue. And then the investment grade people say, okay, I got a fallen angel. At USA, um, we had a debate because our CEO hated junk bonds. We had to ask what happens if a bond gets is a fallen angel? Do we have to sell it immediately or can we keep it? And we had that big debate and our CEO was all over the board on that. It was hard to pin them down. So S&P said is considered downgrading 
Boeing. Moody says considering bits, so all three of them. Um, so they have $52 billion in outstanding debt. Boeing has worn out its welcome investment grade index. Obviously, this is a firm in horrible shape. I don't know if I told you my theory. My theory is, um, so forgive me if I just told you this before, but Umbrier in Brazil, incredible company, just incredible plane producer, just like Boeing, except for incredible, run by a bunch of engineers who build planes. Boeing, disastrous firm, who, who runs Boeing? Bunch of Harvard MBAs, bunch of finance people. Who would you who would you rather run a, an airplane airplane manufacturing firm, an Harvard MBA or an, an engineer? I'd much rather an engineer running it. I don't mind the Harvard MBA being the CFO, but I don't want him the CEO. So what is Har what has Boeing been doing? It's been in all these these Harvard MBA games with their stockholders, which is not a way to run a company. Um, JV Morgan isn't taking a view on the likelihood of it becoming junk. Um, you don't have good transitions, um, mainly because that's a big demarcation between investment grade and investment grade, investment grade. There's almost nothing else in finance where something just shifts. It's not like a large cap, cap company gets to be small cap and it moves. No one notices that. Or a small company becomes large. I mean, they notice when firms go in and out of the S&P, but it's not like this. This is huge because no one comes in the S&P at 8% of the S&P. You don't join the S&P at 8%. Um, so a lot of times these happen in economic downturns. Boeing is interesting in that it's doing it in the middle of nowhere. Here to talk about when Ford and GM went under, they took 8.3%. 8, 8 so GM came into the indice, 8% of the indice. That's just unheard of. I don't know what Boeing's going to be. Uh -huh. So like when, when a company goes into the S&P and it's weighted as, as their market cap grows, is that how it changes? Yeah, because it's market weighted. Yeah, and S&P... Um, they update their indice all, all year long. But most people can, there's people out there because when a stock joins the S&P 500, it gets a bump. It's called the S&P bump. When it goes down, it gets up down. So there are people out there trying to guess what S&P is going to move in because if you can buy the stock before it goes in the S&P. So Vanguard used to do that and others used to do that. It used to give them an extra little return. Now it doesn't work because everybody's doing it. Uh, but on the fixed income side, it's it's very, very different. It's a bunch of people are going to be forced to sell Boeing's bond. A bunch of people are going to be forced to buy them. But they're two different markets. The markets for large cap and small cap are essentially all the same type of people. But for bonds, it's very, very different. So this is a pretty big deal, something to be watching. Um, could happen. Big price moves. Um, high proportion of longer dated debt. High yield funds. Um, could be impacted because they may have to buy it. I mean, it, you're going to make a decision. You might say, I don't like Boeing, but you're still going to make a decision. When something's 8% of your index and you say, I'm not going to buy it, that's a big decision. Apple's about that size of the S&P 500. You say, yeah, I don't like Apple. Well, not to buy Apple, that could crush you if Apple takes takes off. So interesting article came out right after our class. So that was this perfect timing. All right, active versus passive investing. So again, if I were you at your age, I'd put 80% of my money into an all US stock passive index fund. The other 20% would be my play money, buy some battery manufacturing, some macro firms, some EV firms that aren't well known, not Tesla. As I mentioned, Kathy Woods goes to see what she's buying. Uh, what's interesting out there, it's kind of late on the weight loss drugs because those firms are extremely huge and have made a lot. But if you can find one, I mean, to me, mac microbes, there's a few micro companies out there that just don't have any earnings. They haven't figured it out yet, but they are curing a lot of diseases. So we'll see if that happens. The battery manufacturing companies might be a good time to look at them because their stock prices have been tanking because EV sales haven't been that good. Um, some of the alternative energy companies, you know, some of them are huge like Nextera. So trying to find a smaller one that's doing something. But yeah, try to find something with the other 20%, some idea and be patient. Don't invest the entire 20%. You know, find some stocks you're interested in, buy in early, let it ride, see, see how it goes. Uh, and and don't trade. You know, don't make the retail mistake if it's up 20%, you're all excited. You're wanting the thing to go up 40,000%. You're waiting for that thing to become a multi-billion dollar stock. 
So that's how I, I would do it. I would probably stick mainly to the U.S. Um, I might bet on a few ETFs that are emerging market kind of con country specific or maybe a frontier fund, although frontier funds are awfully, awfully risky. Um, but passive is you're just going to buy the market. So I'm going to recommend you go 80% passive and then 20% hyper, hyper uh, active. Or you're gonna you're gonna try to pick 10, 20 companies that you just think are gonna take off. Uh, you may have to build up your portfolio for a few years until you know have fifty, hundred thousand bucks. So you can that twenty percent is actual something. Um, so what you're trying to do with active is you're trying to beat the market. So if the market's up four point two percent then you've got to make 4.2% 4, 4. plus the expenses that it costs you to invest. Because if it costs you 0.5% to invest, you got to make 4.7%, then you subtract your fees and you got 4.2. That's one of the reasons I told you expenses are really important. Management fees are 100 basis points. They've got to beat the market not by one basis point. They have to beat by 100 just to break even, just to tie the market. So they start off with this disadvantage. So you got to keep your costs low. That's why a lot of firms that try to beat the market are very computer technical, kind of AI type of firms that don't have to have a lot of employees, a lot of computer work. Um, you're trying to find fund managers that have good processes, can beat the market. If you take my risk management class, we'll do an attribution project in there. I'll show you how you can do attribution. Uh, the Bloomberg machine has an attribution model that you can do and what you're trying to do it's not just see, did the manager beat the market, but how did they do it? So attribution, have y'all heard of attribution before? That sound familiar? So attribution is for, a, let's say you're a large cap stock manager and you're trying to beat the S&P 500. There's two ways you can beat it, sector selection and stock selection. So did you pick the correct sectors? So technology was up 30%. If you're underweighted on technology, that hurts you. And the second one is stock selection. So you might've been overweight on technology, but the stocks you picked in technology didn't do well. And so if you go on the Bloomberg's portfolio function and you put a portfolio in there, they'll tell you how much was sector selection and how much was stock selection. Now, when you add international, what else do you add into there? What else can you select on international stocks? Which, right. which country, which currency? So attribution there goes, well, you underweighted Japan and Japan's up a bunch. But inside Japan, you picked the right Japanese companies. But you were overweight on the yen and the yen is down. So you have all those pieces and you're trying to figure out where did you add value. So you might be a great stock selector, but a horrible sector selector, a horrible country selector, you know, who knows what. That's what attribution is. It's pretty cool stuff. I did attribution at USA. It's really pretty cool stuff to do. You can do it on the bond fund. The problem I had at USA on bond funds is you have one category called other and most of the attribution was in other. So you added 10 basis points for your duration, you added 20 basis points for credit, five basis points for convexity, and 87 basis points for other. And that always bothered me, there was too much in other. But that's what you do as an active manager, you wanna have some kind of attribution. So I strongly recommend set up an active portfolio, you can do it in paper, do it on the Bloomberg machine, and then let Bloomberg do your attribution. I, I can assure you, you do that going into an interview, they'll be shocked. Say, so, yeah, I've got, I don't have money, enough money as a college student. So I built a paper portfolio in Bloomberg. I ran it through Bloomberg's portfolio and here's the attribution. And you actually want it to have some bad numbers because you've come in there with only good numbers. They're going to think you're lying and that you created a portfolio with historical, but you don't want it all to be bad. So you want to have some bad stuff and good stuff. That's, a, that's exactly what they're looking for. They want you to come in and be brutally honest that, yeah, I, I picked this stock and it did well, but then I messed up on this stock. And then what they want to hear you say is, what I learned from this trade is. And that's your like, so you need to set yourself up for that kind of home run hit in an interview. And, and boy, you could do it by setting up a paper portfolio. If you want to learn how to do that, come by and I'll show you how to do it in Bloomberg. It's pretty, pretty cool. Um, just the attribution of sector versus stock is pretty advanced stuff to do. Uh, and very few small investors can do that, but you can do it because you have Bloomberg. Um, Performance is extremely inconsistent. No one beats every single year. It's just just quite impossible. James Simons, I'm sure, had some bad quarters in there somewhere before he passed away. And he didn't have any of them. Warren Buffett has had some horrible years. There's been like every 10 years, there's an article about how Bar Warren Buffett has lost his edge. He's no longer any good. 
And then two years later, he's back and talking and he's winning again. This Everybody goes through cycles. So if you're going to do the active side, I strongly encourage you to do the active side now on paper. You don't have to do it with real life number. Do it now just so you can say you're doing it. That's because they expect you in interviews. They just assume all finance majors are doing this. And this is the reason you're a finance major. So do it even if you don't believe in it. You want to be a passive investor or at a minimum, be active with ETFs, large cap, small cap, growth value. You know, at least be active on which market that you're in. So I, I encourage you to do that. But for most people, passive is probably the best answer because most people don't have 50, 60 hours a week to work on this. It's just, it's tough. So you just buy index funds. So um, Jack Bogle is the big index person. He pushed this with Vanguard. When he got these things approved in the late 70s, Fidelity came out and talked about how stupid that was. They had an advertisement. It says um, uh, Americans shouldn't shoot to be mediocre. And that's what he confused. He said indexing was. How did Jack Bogle win that argument? He beat all the active managers by you know, 90%, 95% of them. Uh -huh. huh? Well, it's both. Well, who is JFK? John Kennedy or Jack Kennedy. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, isn't Jack a, a nickname for John? <laughs> so anyway, so Jack Bogle, John Bogle. Um, all right. So, so he won that argument by keeping his fees really, really low. Fidelity came in and said, this is mediocre, mediocrity. Americans don't do that. Guess, guess what Fidelity did a few years later? They started offering index funds because that was, that was what was where the money was going. I'm really, I, I think USA really missed on this because USA started their investment firm. They should have, they started their investment firm about the same time Vanguard started. They should have called up Vanguard and struck a deal with them to do passive at USA. It would have been perfect. USA would be a trillion dollar firm today if they had done that, but they didn't do it. They tried to do the old active route and they just didn't have the size of a firm to be able to manage that. Pretty tough to do. Um, a lot of people say passive is the way to go because markets are efficient. Eugene Fama back in the 70s came up with the efficient market hypothesis. It has dominated finance and academia for like 40 years. It's gotten a few uh, people questioning, like Dr. Lowe, one of my favorite professors. He has an entire book questioning the efficient market hypothesis. Uh, but it is sacrosanct. You can't question it in, in academia in a lot of schools. Um, but how are markets efficient? EMH is another way to say it. There's two ways they can be efficient, information efficiency and fundamental efficiency. So efficient, information efficiency means when new information hits the market, the market reacts immediately. So new information, you really can't beat the market with new information because the market reacts so fast. And I think that's true. Markets are very, very fast to react. When I was a security analyst, I remember it was five o'clock. I was ready to leave and no one was leaving. And I felt really guilty. Why is no one leaving? Because they all left on time all the time. I was usually the last one out. And they're like, you stupid person. Don't you know IBM's reporting today? IBM used to be the stock. They're not anymore. I don't know if y'all realize, have y'all even heard of IBM as a stock? <laughs> so IBM used to not just to be the largest tech stock in the world. They used to be the largest tech stock and larger than all the other tech, tech stocks added together. That's how large IBM was. They were massive. So when IBM reported, they were the blue chip major stock. And so everybody's waiting for IBM to report. And so I decided to sit around and see what that was like. You're going to do your paper too. We should talk about paper two today. You can do your paper two on earnings announcement. That was an earnings announcement. I didn't need to ask when did IBM report. When they reported, I knew it because everybody started flying. Everybody was running to their desk and it was it was immediate. Um, they were redoing their models, updating their Excel spreadsheets, whatever they're doing. Uh, it was immediate. That new information of IBM, they had some theory about IBM and they looked at that quarterly data and they reacted. So markets react extremely fast. So if you're going to be investing in the stock market, and you're looking at analyst reports and the earnings announcements a week later, you're, you're seven times 23 hours and 59 seconds late. I mean, it's, it's you're just not gonna be able to compete that way. Um, so that's why we talk about in the Investment Society having a dashboard. So what you normally set up in Bloomberg is your dashboard. 
So I remember one guy, Credit Suisse, he had 11 Bloomberg machines on his desk. Every one of them had a different dashboard. You can see what's going on here, what's going on here. They, they're flashing re green and red. Um, that's a dashboard. In the Investment Society, we set up in Excel, so everything just comes in. But we look at it once a week, so we're pretty slow. But you're supposed to do that. Now, Yahoo will do this. Some other places will do that. Well, they'll send you an email. Um, so you tell them, I want emails. Mark. Any of y'all done that with Yahoo Finance? I want an email anytime this company reports something and you get a and you get a message that can be pretty powerful. Bloomberg will do that same thing where you can set it up and they'll send you messages. That's that information efficiency, extremely fast. Now what's happening? Who's doing all this today? It's not humans anymore, is it? It's computers. Do y'all know there's people in New York City that are trying to get a hundred yards closer to the exchange so that they can be there a truant of a second faster? You know, the difference in the speed of the light of 100 yards is how much faster they're trying to get there. You realize that's what we're up against. It's their AI versus their competitor's AI, and they can be 100 yards faster, if look closer, they're a, whatever, a trillionth of a second faster, they win. I mean, it's gotten crazy. And that's what you're competing against. So it's markets getting tough. But where you can compete is the second one, which is fundamental efficiency. And what that says is all securities are correctly priced. Not only are we quick getting information, but we interpret it correctly. Or to the extent that we interpret it incorrectly, our errors offset each other. One person's too high, one person's too low. They just offset each other. So there are no market bubbles. The market never makes the mistake all in the same direction. So NVIDIA is not overpriced because everybody's making the right assumptions about NVIDIA. Um, GameStop is not overpriced because everybody's making these good fundamental assumptions. I'm being a little bit sarcastic or facetious there. Um, that one's a little bit more questionable. People do believe there are bubbles. Now, do y'all know what a market bubble is? Y'all have heard of that? So the bubble king, and I do recommend you read his stuff. Um, He writes some really great stuff. He's the, he's the king on market bubbles. Sure. He studied, and he's he's predicting a bubble right now. Um, he hasn't quite got. He's been saying it for quite some time, so it gets a little embarrassing, you know, after two or three years. But um, he's predicting it. But he's getting up there in age, so I don't think he's really involved with his company as much as he used to be. He's the G of GMO. Uh, very, very highly respected firm. If you can find what you're looking for is not what he's currently talking about. What you're looking for is this discussion of historical bubbles because they're very, very fascinating. Because what he tells you is all the previous bubbles and how you could have seen it coming. So he's giving you that insight. What does a bubble look like? How does a market get grossly overpriced and it's going to have to crash 40, 50%? So all you're seeing now is him talking about the bubble right now. There he is. He looks pretty mad. Um, yeah, that's all of this is, is. So maybe if I put the word historical market bubbles, maybe something else would come up. I don't know. Yeah, I love this. The guy who predicted 2008 crash. Uh, there is um, Dr. Doom did the same thing. And so he's a genius. And then you predicted uh, five of the next zero crashes. And people are like, maybe he's not that smart. But that's how they introduce you. There's one woman who predicted that crash. And she was wrong so many times after that. But like 10 years later, she's the one that predicted the 2008 crash. They forget to tell you that she missed all the rest of them. But yeah, so he's now predicting the next crash. And he's been wrong for quite some time. So Eugene Fama came up with this. He did these three tests, weak form, semi-strong form, and strong form. I don't know if y'all have seen this in another class. You should know the efficient market hypothesis, but this is probably as much as you need to know. I don't think you need to go back and, and read Eugene Fama. He's still around. He's still kicking. He's working for a hedge fund. People are making fun of him, saying you don't believe in market efficiency if you're working for a hedge fund. Mm -hmm. He says, no, 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 I still believe markets are efficient. I'm just trying to figure out how to get paid for taking risks. So he's, uh, I think he's kind of tainted his, his reputation. But um, so the weak form test is asking about 
technical analysis. If all you have is prior prices, can you predict when to get into the market? That's called technical analysis. Eugene Fama says that doesn't work. Dr. Lowe says it does work. So there you got two huge, huge players in the finance world. One says it doesn't work. One says it does. I think Fama's probably his best evidence that it doesn't work is technical analysis. They look at charts through chartists. So he created a lot of charts. Some of them he created with actual stocks. Some of them he created randomly. And the technical analyst couldn't tell the difference between the random charts and the actual real life charts. So if they're actually seeing something, it shouldn't just be randomness. So I think that's a pretty strong argument. But read Dr. Lowe's book. He believes technical analysis works. The semi strong is asking about if you had public information, including prior prices. So their earnings, what management is saying, what other analysts are saying, you have public information. Can you beat the market? Fama said no on that as well, but that's one that's kind of hard to measure because you don't know what everybody's doing. Most people think James Simons was beating the market. Um, but he said no, that was his conclusion. If you think that one is false, then you probably should be a passive investor because you're you're just not going to beat the market because public information, it's, it's, it's not going to help you. Everybody else has the information. That's fundamental analysis. <clears throat> that's what I teach in my secure analysis class. Um, it's what most colleges teach. And then the last one is a strong form. What if you had all information, including non-public information? You had inside information. Could you beat the market? That one's hard to test if you don't really, really know. There are people who try to bet on this. So there are investors. What they look at is they assume management has inside information. And so what they do is they watch management stock trades and let's say the CFO of a firm normally sells 300,000 shares a year, just maybe the fund, their yacht or something. But then one year they sell 800,000 shares. They say, ding, 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 the CFO is selling a bunch of extra shares. What's going on? They must have inform inside information. Um, and you trade on non-public information. So you're on a plane trip out of San Antonio, the CEO of Valero sitting next to you, or the CEO and CFO of Valero sitting next to you, and you hear the CFO say, man, when this gets when this hits the market, that, that stock, our stock's going to soar. And you go home and buy Valero stock. Would that be legal? What do you think? Illegal. You think it's legal? Yep. Illegal. It would be illegal. You would, now, would the SEC find you? So what are they going to do? They're going to say, OK, Luke just bought 12,000 call options on Valero. He's never done that before. Oh, look, he was flying. Oh, he was flying sitting next to, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, they're going to find you. And Luke is really smart. So he doesn't trade, but he calls his uncle. And as he says, oh, this guy trading 12,000 shares. Oh, look, his nephew is on a plane. So yeah, they'll, they'll probably find you. Now, if you're a small enough investor, maybe they won't find you. But that's what they're looking for is unusual trades before a major announcement. What should Luke do? He should go back home and call whom? The first person he calls. Lawyer. His lawyer. Okay. His lawyer at his firm. And what's his lawyer going to do? His lawyer is going to call Valero and say what? You have non-public information that has been heard. You need to announce it today, not tomorrow. It's already out there. You need the announcement. And Luke doesn't do any trades. It just sits there on his hands. Doesn't tell anybody other than his lawyer. And then he, a week later, finds out his lawyer bought 12,000 call offices sure. before he called Billy Barrow. And so then, then he's got to report his lawyer. Um, so, yeah. The key, though, is it has to be material. If it's not material, you can trade on it. If it's material, material, it's illegal. If it's not material, it's not illegal. But then what does Luke have to decide? <laughs> he doesn't have to decide if it's legal or not, I mean, or material or not. He has got to decide if a jury will decide if it's material or not. OK, he can't just say, oh, I think it's immaterial and trade on it. That's not what the jury is looking at. They're looking at whether or not a rational person would consider that to be. So if here's the CEO of Valero saying, you know what, we're going to have to fire our landkeeper, a landscaper. I just don't like that guy. And he goes and trades on that. Would that be illegal? Probably not be illegal. That would probably be fine. Um, and it's actually legal. Let's say he sits. Let's say this is a flight. Sorry to pick on Luke. He's, this is a flight from San Antonio, Australia. So he hears 5,000 pieces of non-public information and are all immaterial. 
but Luke has written them all together, all down. And we puts them all together. It's material. Can he trade on that? That he can trade on. All right. But again, it's up to the jury, not up to Luke. So again, he should probably call his lawyer and then he and his lawyer can decide and then they can go trade if they want to. So be careful on this. If you take the CFA exam, that's a big part of the ethics part of the CFA exam. When can you trade on non-public information? You better get it right. Most people just don't touch it. I know Martha Stewart, Stewart supposedly went to jail for, non, for trading on inside information, but I don't think she actually went to jail for that. I think she went to jail for plagiarism, but you can look it up. Um, it was really stupid because this is a very rich person who went to jail for a very insignificant trade. So not, not a smart thing to do. So, so this is a hard thing to test, but there are firms out there you can trade on a CFO making trades. That's not that's public information because they have to file that with the SEC. So you can trade on that. That's not mine public. But that's kind of the indirect way of trading on inside information because you think the CFO has some kind of information. Uh, that CFO could go to jail if they're trading on that. What about Congress? If Powell comes to Congress and they have a closed session, he says things that you know are going to move the market. Can Congress trade? Can a congressman trade on that? That's being a big debate. So historically, they could. There's supposedly been new laws, but who knows what they can do today. People have really questioned that. Uh, there have been studies looking at con congressmen and women trading on inside form information and concluding that even though they had inside information, they're not very good investors and they still don't do well. So it doesn't seem to be helping them. But um, So there are rules for you and rules not for others. So if you have power, you don't necessarily have to follow the rules. But anyway, G Gene Fama did all these tests. I don't know if anyone's tried to update these tests. So Dr. Lowe is on the other side disagreeing with this. Dr. Lowe does believe uh, markets go in patterns that there is. Um, he disagrees. If you heard the book, Random Walk Down yeah. Wall Street, have y'all heard of that book? So Dr. Lowe has proven that book wrong in showing that stocks don't move in a random walk. They actually do go in patterns that are predictable. So there are disagreements on this, but Fama has, it will dominate your college classes. Markets are efficient. You can't beat the market uh, because the markets are just too good at what they do. But if everybody goes passive, what happens? Doesn't active investing have a purpose? And it actually does. It's called allocative efficiency. The market needs to decide which are the good companies, which are the bad companies. Good companies stay in business. Bad companies go out of business. You need someone making those decisions and... That's what they should do. But right now, passive investing is much larger than it used to be. But it's still only about 30, 35 percent. There's still a lot of people that are active managers and probably will be for quite some time. So that probably isn't yet having a huge impact. There are papers, though, written on what what is the impact of all these passive investors on markets? Um, you know, BlackRock and Vanguard are the two biggest firms and they're also the two biggest passive that's trillions of dollars just sitting there where no one really cares what the firms are doing. They just want the market. That probably is having some impact, but who knows? Um, Warren Buffett says you can win as an active manager if you're, if you're patient. So he says investing is like batting, but when those strikes are called. Can you imagine Major League Baseball where they never called strikes? You can just wait until you're the pitch you want. The games would last a really long time because you just wear the pitcher out. I agree with Warren Buffett. There is some truth to that. That's why I say on that 20%, you're looking for those big ideas. Be really, really patient. This is one of my strategies. I'm looking for two and three Sigma events. And I'm real careful. And I did this back in 2020. I saw the bond market was in a three Sigma event. So I shorted the bond market because rates were so, so low. I'm looking at those extreme events. Uh, like when, when Meta fell down to $40, I viewed that as a three Sigma event. So I'm looking at those extreme, but I have it in such a way that I'm extremely patient. I'm waiting for huge, huge moves so I can really buy cheap because we tend to get too, too impatient. So if you're going to do 20% of your money in individual stocks that you think are really going to go, set up your rules so you buy them very infrequently. Don't be buying two stocks a week. You might buy one or two a year. So it takes you 10 years to get your 20 stocks loaded up. Be really patient. Um, so, but unfortunately in finance, it's true that if you're patient, you can win, but we were paid in finance for swinging. We weren't paid for hitting. So unfortunately, that's why you're, you're paid. If you're really patient, people just, 
They think you're not doing your job. My boss irritated me so much. Oh my word, I uh, have this. Uh, well, he won't know which boss I'm talking about. But anyway, Mondays in my day. What are you going to do, Ron? The Fed's talking about this. Yeah, we're not going to do anything. Next day, what are you going to do? I saw this in the news. Yeah, we're not doing anything. He thought my IQ went from 140 to 70 every other day. It's like, wow, that's brilliant, Ron. Wow, you're an idiot, Ron. It's like, like, no, that's the way finance, you know, we're not we're not these perfect predictors of the future. We 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 are we're about as stupid as everybody else. Predicting the future is really, really, really tough. So you got to decide what kind of investor you're gonna be. But I say right now, just start. Be on paper, mess up, make make mistakes, lose money on paper so that you learn, start learning because you learn in finance through by messing up. You don't learn by, in fact, the worst thing you can do is be successful when you start because that gives you confidence and confidence is the worst thing in the world for an investor. <clears throat> All right, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip through this section. You can read this in the notes, shorting securities. You wanna learn how to do that. That's when you sell a stock that you don't own. Do you think NVIDIA is really overpriced? You can sell NVIDIA. You got to buy it back in the future. You hopefully buy it back at a cheaper price. So you can sell it for, say, 130 and buy it back for 110 How much can you lose if you store a security? What's your max loss? Infinity. I never short something where I don't cap it out with, with call options. So if I short NVIDIA at one at 130, I'm going to buy a call option at 160. So if it shoots up to 160, that's the most I can lose. I protect myself. Um, I remember I was on the phone. I had to do white courting, they call it USAA, where I'd sit in with a sales rep on the phone. And she, they were talking to this, this woman. And they go, oh, by the way, you're still short this stock. She says, oh, I'm still short that stock. Oh, I forgot about that. I was like, I'm not supposed to talk on the white court. And I started just screaming into the phone. What? How can you have a short stock and not remember it? That's unlimited loss. That's just crazy to me. So that person should not be shorting stocks. Um, at USA, um, our, our, our portfolios, we let, we loaned our securities out. Most portfolios do that. So when you want to sort a security, you got to borrow someone's securities. And we loaned ours out because you make money doing that. Uh, we had investors complaining to us that we were lending our securities out, but you're going to do it because it adds five, 10 basis points to your return. You just got to do it. But um, that's the whole world right there. You can look that up, securities lending. Um, you could make that your whole career. I don't know if I'd be kind of a dangerous career, but yeah, if people are going to short securities, they got to sell a security they don't own. So they got to borrow from someone. That securities lending. Mutual funds make a few basis points doing that. Um, so it's 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 a good good market. You make more money the smaller the security, the less liquid it is because you get paid more for lending out a security that's hard to short. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into that. Y'all can read that in the notes. Um, buying on margin, since they borrowing money to borrow to invest, you can do this with your broker, or you can do it through your credit union. The credit union is a lot more expensive. So my credit union, if you want to borrow money to invest, they would charge you 18%. Your broker will probably be a lot cheaper than that. So essentially, you borrow half the money, you can double your returns, but you do have to pay interest on that. So that, that does come back in. You do have to have margin account. You do have to hold, hold securities there because they don't want to be on the hook if somehow you mess up on that. Um, so... Final margin, pretty dangerous. Shorting is pretty dangerous. So only do that in a paper portfolio when you start. Don't start off doing that with real life money, especially not with your uncle's money. You know, start off simple at the beginning. Now, if you're doing the market watch game with the investment society, this is exactly what you should do. Because the goal in that game is either be first place or last place. That's not normal investing. That's that's Vegas. You're trying to just, I won't say that's what one of our students in here is doing that's winning a that game right now, but uh, you do have a very different philosophy to win that game than you do in a real life portfolio. So this is the kind of stuff you do if it's a it's a paper portfolio competition game. You just you do it on margin. You do short trades. You do whatever you can so you really leverage up your return. <laughs> All right, expenses with investing. We'll talk about paper to make. Well, we'll see. We may start it today, but let me get into expenses. So expenses investing really depends on whether you're a small investor or a big investor. They're radically different between those two. So, and it, it also depends on whether you're doing it yourself or hiring a manager. manager. If you do it yourself, you're going to hire a broker. If you don't have a brokerage account, again, set one up. I use Charles Schwab. You can use Robinhood. Yeah. They're, they're starting to consolidate because they're having trouble making money. 
Um, get your brokerage account set up. They'll charge commissions, but now it's essentially zero for commissions. It used to be 50 bucks a trade. Now it's essentially zero. Um, so it's very, very efficient, very easy to set up. Once you get it set up, the trades are very easy to do. If you want to do options and other derivatives, futures, they're going to make you sign a contract to do that. So you can't just do that. One warning on the contract. I like to do options to heads risk, to reduce risk, but you can't say that on the application. If you say you're investing to manage risk, they won't let you do options. So you have to answer that you're an aggressive growth investor, and that's the only way they let you do options. So it's strange that they set up their question like that. Um, and then the next thing you're going to pay is the bid ask spread. So just to show you in the market. Let's do a crazy stock here. All right, so the bid is 2116, the ask is 2117. Which do you think you would pay? You're buying stocks. You're thinking buy, pay the higher price or pay the lower price? Be as cynical as you wanna be. Yeah, the ask is what you gotta pay. If you sell the stock, what do you think you're gonna get? The bid, all right? So that's what you're. So if you were to buy the stock and immediately sell it, sell it, you're gonna you're gonna lose the bid ask, right? So that's your cost as a small investor. Large investors don't really see that. All the trading I did at USAA, we usually got in between the bid and ask. So we usually didn't have that that happening for us. We got pretty good execution for small investors. The bid ask is a big part of what they're doing. Um, it's probably your biggest expense now that commissions are going away. It's that bid ask. Be really careful. I, I wish I could show you a really wide bid ask. Um, I don't know if I can or not, though. I'm trying to find a stock that's not widely traded. Yeah, that's a pretty big. Look at that 67 and 78. That's a pretty big. That's um, yeah, 11 cents right off the bat. So be careful. If you see a big bid ask spread, be real careful. You may be walking into a major disaster, especially on options. You got to be really careful. A lot of these exchange trading funds have options, but sometimes a bid ask is massive. I wouldn't touch a trade like that. If you're seeing something like that, there's something going on that's not right in the market and you're going to get, get really ripped off. So look for that one penny difference. <clears throat> Now for large investors, they don't really have the bid ask. They just play, they play, play in between. What they have is market impact costs. You as a small investor, this is your hugest advantage is you don't have market impact. Market impact is because you're a big trader, a big investor, when you put your trade in, your trade's gonna move the market. You're gonna get a worse price than you wanted. So you have a large block, you need to trade a million shares and the daily float, the daily volume of trade is say 1.2 million. So you're gonna be like 90% of the normal daily float. That's gonna cause that price to move. If you're buying, it's gonna cause the price to go up. If you're selling, it's gonna come down and it's gonna come down to your detriment. So if you're buying, it's gonna cause the price to go up and you're gonna to have to pay that higher price. Um, there are actually investors that their entire model is to watch Fidelity and try to guess what Fidelity is gonna do so that they can buy ahead of them. So they can front run Fidelity, which is legal because they don't, there's no inside information. So they think Fidelity is about to buy a thousand shares or whatever. They'll go ahead and make a trade today. And when Fidelity does that, that market impact will cause the stock price to go up. <laughs> Trading volume. Uh -huh. Well, they look at the trades they've been making historically. So they're essentially just they pick some manager Fidelity and they just memorize the guy backwards and forwards. Yeah, I mean, it's. There's one firm we talked about, that's all they do. If you spend 50 hours a week doing nothing but watching one Fidelity trader yeah. and portfolio manager, you could probably figure it out what they're going to do. Um, all right, so market impact, trading volume is key. If you're really large, I've done transition manager several times. There's times I haven't had massive trades, but I might, I had somewhere I had to move like 500 million bucks which today doesn't sound like a lot, but 500 million bucks, you can move a market with 500 million bucks. So I use a transition manager and they'll help me help me hide some of the trades. One thing they'll do is cross trades. That's kind of the easiest thing to do. You find a big index investor, 
and they're trading a million shares, you need to trade a million shares. You say, you know what? Let's just trade shares. You're buying, I'm selling. Let's just trade shares. Whatever the closing price is, that's what we say we trade it at. And both parties says, yeah, that's fine. So we don't have any market impact. So you do that as much as you can. And then what you do, you try to trade, you try to spread the trades out over a few days, try to hide them. It's you're trying to get the best execution you can get. That's a phrase you should have in your vocabulary, best execution. You're trying to get that best price that you're not paying a bad bid price. I mean, a ask price or, or getting hurt on the market impact. Spot cap managers will sometimes close their funds so they don't get so large to have that market impact because small cap, small companies don't have much float. They don't have a lot of volume. And so if you're trying to trade a lot of small cap shares, you can really move that, that price. And so then you have to be really, really care, careful. Um, I wasn't a big fan of transition managers. I used four or five of them. One guy I talked to a lot, he was from Credit Suisse. He was like Mr. Transition Manager. There was a Transition Manager magazine, which you probably can't believe that existed. He was on the cover like two thirds of the time. I think he wrote the mag magazine, but he was a transition manager. Interesting guy. He went to New York to be an actor and that didn't work out. So he became a transition manager. Um, now he's running a hedge fund in India. Um, I'm on his board. I haven't talked to him in three years, but um, interesting guy. He could never convince me that they were the best transition manager. And he kept telling me, oh, just give me give me an hour every time I convince you. And I gave him an hour and he suddenly because a lot of it is after they do the transition, they can't prove to you that they saved you money. They can just theoretically prove to you using statistics that maybe they saved you money. So to me, it seemed a little bit questionable that the person that I gave all this, uh, all this trades, all these trades to telling me they saved me all this money when it's based on some kind of estimate. So, but this is important, important to understand. You can't just, you know, you need to sell a million shares. You don't just sell a million shares. You've got to sit down and figure out the market impact. And so big investors, that's a huge part of their business to figure that out. So we just had one of our students get hired for Victory Capital on her trade desk. Um, his name's Kevin. And so I actually recommended him to that job. And one of the reasons I said is the other two traders were named Kevin. So I said, you need another Kevin. That's not the reason they hired him, but they now have three Kevins. But that is a perfect job out of college. The trade desk, that's what, if you can do the trade desk, you're gonna learn, you don't wanna do it for 10 years, 20 years. But if you can make that your first two years, my word, you got a huge advantage. It's pretty stressful. It's extremely stressful. In fact, it's scary to death. It's really because you're on the phone, you're trying to do things and you're talking to people that know a whole lot more than you do, but you got to get the trade done. It is a great, great job. But they're the ones that deal with all this best execution and all this transition. They're the ones that have to figure all of that out. So yeah, if you can get on the trade desk, I've had a few of my students on trade desk and they've all have done extremely well after that. Uh -huh. Interesting. Can you explain how it's bad when you buy like a million shares or something and it bumps the price up? Like, how well, is that? Well, you got to have all these buyers of the million shares. And the daily float, let's say, is, um, well, but you can look at drug, their, their stock up today. So if you look at the volume, so 5 million shares. So let's say you got to do a 3 million share trade. The average volume is 4 million, right? So you need an extra 4 million buyers to jump into the market. And how are you going to induce them to buy it? You know, volume shoots up because you have a seller, price is going to, is going to fall. If you have a buyer, the price is going to go up. All right. That's just, that's just supply and demand. All right. It's, it's just the nature of, it. even though the reason you may be selling it is not because you think it's overpriced. You may just not be raising money or something, but the market doesn't care. They don't, you don't have enough buyers out there. So the price is going to drop and it's going to drop before you sell it. Your sell is going to cause it to drop before you sell it. Um, <clears throat> So you look at you look at the volume. What do you think volume looks like on the day that they announce earnings? Uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to know which day. This is paper two. I'm kind of talking about paper two. Which day, if it says they announced earnings on October 14th, which day would you be looking at? Well, if they announced earnings before open on the 14th, you can see high volume on the 14th. If they announce earnings after close on the 14th, guess when you'll see the high volume? On the 15th, that's how you can tell when they announce earnings, whether it's before open or after open. If they announce them, I mean, after close. 
They announced before open, you'll see the volume on that day. If they announce, it, if they announce after close, you'll see the volume on the next day. So sometimes it's confusing. They don't always tell you. Um, you have to kind of figure it out on your own. But I'll tell you the paper too. I'll be actually be giving you all information. But yeah, the J daily volume, none of you are trading 4.7 million shares. If you're trading 200 shares, no one's going to care. If you're trading 2 million, 3 million, 4 million shares, yeah, it's, it's going to move the market and it's going to hurt you as an investor. Okay. Um, now, if you're using a manager, your fees are the portfolio management fees. Um, it's a percentage of their assets under management. Uh, it, there's all different ways to express it. It can be a 1% fee. It can be 2 and 20. That means like a hedge fund. They charge you 2% plus they get 20% of the profits, which seems like a really good deal if you can get it. Some funds charge front end and exit loads. You would never buy a mutual fund with a front end load ever. There's no, absolutely no reason to, to do that. There's no evidence they do any better. In fact, there's evidence they do much worse than other funds. So never do that. You'll see some really high quality funds with the front end load. Uh, capital capital groups coming. One of their mutual funds it used to be called the Washington Mutual. I, I assume they still have it. It had a huge front end load. That wasn't because capital groups an evil company. It's because Washington Mutual, they wanted that to be an institutional fund. They didn't want small investors. And so their institutional funds didn't pay the front end load, but their retail investors did. And that's the way they they got they got around that. Um, so beware of fees. There's no evidence that paying more fee, more fees is going to give you better quality. There's no relationship between how much you pay. I mean, how much would you pay more for a um a, a Porsche or a, a Toyota? Which would you pay more for? A Porsche. Are you getting better car? Ferrari? Would you pay more for a Ferrari than a Toyota? Is it worth it? That works with cars, works with houses. I mean, what if houses are random? You know, a $500,000 house, you don't know if it's 2,000 square feet or 10,000. But with investing, there's no relationship between how much you pay in fees and the performance of the fund. It's completely unrelated. I mean, if anything, it's, it's related in the opposite direction. The more you pay, the worse you do because you're going to be hurt by the fees. So watch fees. It's the easiest thing to look at. Passive investing has the lowest fees. The 401k plan I set up at USA, I've set up an S&P 500 index fee the fund. It charged one basis point, one basis point. And they probably didn't even pay that because they did securities lending and the securities lending probably earned them four basis points. So they probably made the S&P plus three basis points. They probably beat the market. Um, so it should be extremely inexpensive. That's one way you can really test your 401k plan. First, do they have index fit funds? And they should. And then what are the fees on the index funds? Because they should be dirt cheap, one, two basis points, especially on the S&P 500. If you see a, an S&P 500 index fund on a 401k plan charging 20, 30 basis points, they're, they're ripping you off. That's just not, that's not the way to do it. So passive investing, the way most people should go, that's not just me saying that. Warren Buffett says that. Charles Ellis says that. Uh, Munger says that. Bogle says that. Um, everybody everybody that um, doesn't have, um, you know, isn't getting money from the till, they will say that. People who are getting money from the till, obviously. There's a really funny um, frontline documentary talking about this. And, oh, man, that they this one, this one person... She is so embarrassed by this because they really challenged her on this. Is uh, why well, shouldn't your employees just buy index funds? They're a lot cheaper. It's just oh, I don't think they're cheaper, and I don't think they perform any better. And there's so much data that they do. And the next guy on goes, "Yeah, she's either lying to you or she shouldn't be in that job." And it's like she didn't go. I don't know why she did that documentary. She didn't look very good in that documentary. Um, I don't know if she was lying or cheating or. Um, uneducated, but my guess is she was lying because I don't know how, how anyone could know that, but they don't make money off of indexing. They make money off of active management. So she kind of pretended like, yeah, I never heard that before. I don't, I, I don't know. That's true. So at USA, I pushed indexing. We added 10 new funds, all of them indexed. Several of the people on the investment company sent me nasty emails because they didn't like it. And I was like, take your money and go somewhere else. You can take your money out of the 401k. I'm like, we're indexing. Uh, I was all in on that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think there's any reason to play that active game. Just, just give people the, the markets. All right.
We're going to talk return next class. Let's talk about paper two. Any questions on any of that? So we talked about a lot. You're not going to learn this through a lecture. You're going to learn this by doing. So get out there and do this. If you're not doing this, if this is all just boring to you and you're, just, you're checking your phones or whatever, um, change majors. Because <laughs> this is what we do. You got to be a trader. You got to get there and get your get your feet wet. This is what we do in finance. This is what should excite you. This is, should be what you're talking about anytime you go anywhere. This is just this is just your life. Let's talk paper two. I haven't started paper two. You can't really do it until I get you the data, but I am going to get you data for you. If you want to get your own data, we're essentially doing a lot of it in the dashboard team meetings on Wednesday. And that's probably how I'm going to pick the companies is from our dashboard team. Um, so it's an earnings announcement summary. This is a really good paper to do. This is very, very real life. This is something you could actually do in an entry-level job. It's like so-and-so is reporting earnings on Wednesday. I need I need a full report on my desk at the, at the end of the day. They may report at 5 p.m. And that means they want to report at the end of the day on that day. So you're going to be there till 9 p.m. or whatever. Um, this is through November 8th. You can start working on it you know, a lot earlier than that. This is a fast paper, so you probably only have about two weeks to write it, but you don't need much more than that. I'll try to get you to all the companies, say, at least two weeks out. This is a paper you could write the entire paper in a few hours sitting at a Bloomberg machine, which is the way I'd recommend you write it so that you get some Bloomberg experience as well. So the first part looks real similar to paper one. So you're going to have reported earnings versus expected earnings. And are there any, now this reported, be real careful. There's reported and comp. I actually mean comp here. The reported comp. What does comp mean? I remember that from Desk 14. What do they call it, comp? Comparable. Comparable, comparable earnings. Yeah, so the reported is the actual gap earnings. But the market knows, everybody knows there's there's some unusual things in there. We're going to clean this up. Another way, the better term for this is adjusted earnings. That's the better term, adjusted earnings. It's called comp and what I'm going to give you, but it's the adjusted earnings. Uh, some people call it normalized. There's a few terms for it. Um, so the market only focuses on the adjusted earnings, the comparable, the normalized. They don't focus on the actual reported earnings. So when you say, did they beat or miss on expectations, it's that comparable earnings. I wanted to show y'all a really huge historical one, but for some reason it's disappeared from the data and I can't show you anymore, but uh, Best Buy several years ago, their reported earnings was like negative $3, but the adjusted earnings was like positive $3. Massive, massive difference because they had some massive write-off they had to do that quarter and the market just ignored it. All right. You do want to look at it, though. That's why I say any unusual items. This is reported versus comp. Is there any on you? Because usually you'll have to talk about it, but usually it's only three or four words. So what you'll usually say is. X, Y, Z reported. One dollar and 20 cents. One dollar, 42 cents after adjusted for ABC. And then the rest of your paper is about the dollar 42. All right, that's the way you'll normally say it. They, do, they report a dollar 20, but no one cares about the dollar 20. It's a dollar 42 after they made this adjustment. So in your paper, you'll probably want to try to get something like that, but you'll see it in articles. If it's one penny, two penny, you can just ignore it and just give the adjusted earnings, but that's what you're focusing on, the adjusted earnings. When Bloomberg reports the percentage beat or miss, it's off to dollar 42. Okay, any questions on that? <laughs> so that's what I mean by any unusual items. You're just looking at reported versus the comp. How big is that? If it's a penny, less than a penny, you can ignore it. There are some times where there's a difference between reported and comp on revenue. That's pretty rare, but every once in a while you'll see that. You can ignore that for this paper, but I would still check just to see if anything's going on there. Um, so you want to get the reported, 
the ex expected returns, you want to give the percentage beat or miss. And those are the words you use, beat and miss. All right? <laughs> And here you want to get the percentage higher or lower. I have students saying they reported dollar forty-two. It beat last year by twenty percent. You don't beat last year. You're twenty percent higher than last year. You beat the expected. You're higher than the prior. The beat is only against. And I'm I'm not saying that it's bad English or anything. I'm just saying that's the way we talk in finance. So you beat the expected, but you're higher or lower than the prior. Okay. So you need to get the reported. Give the expected and what percentage they beat, and give the prior year's same quarter, not the last quarter. So if it's third quarter, you don't compare it to second quarter. If it's third quarter, you compare it to third quarter last year. Anybody know why you do that? What's that S word? Seasonality, right. You, you, like you've got a retailer, first quarter, you can't compare first quarter to last, you know, that's our first quarter might be December, January, February. You're not going to compare that to last year's. Uh, September, October, November, because of the holiday season. So we compared to the same year last year. Uh, I'll give you those numbers. You'll see how I set it up. All right, so you can talk about that. So did they beat or did they miss? Are they higher or lower than last year? Okay, same quarter last year. Exact same thing on revenue. Reported, expected, and prior year. Exact same three things. So they, they reported $5.2 billion in revenues. This beat expectations by 1.2%, and it's 20% higher than last year, same quarter last year, right? The exact same thing. What you'll find is earnings usually miss or beat by a much bigger percentage than revenues. Earnings might meet or miss, meet or, miss or beat, excuse me, meet, miss or beat, miss or beat by 5, 10%. Revenue might be 1% or 0.8%. And then you have bottom line. I'm going to give you margins. This is all about margins. Some firms, you want to talk about gross margins. This has been real important for retail and food because of the inflation of 2022. A lot of them are having, they're having their gross margins squeezed. But I'll give you these numbers. Some firms, gross margin doesn't mean much, but I'll give you the numbers. That's what you're looking at the bottom line. Top line is revenue. Bottom line is your margins, your net margins. I usually give you EBITDA margin. I like that one the best, um, but it depends. Some firms don't have an expected number for EBITDA, so I had to give you EBIT. So I'll give you whatever is available. Um, so you just talk about that. Did they miss or beat? Were they higher or lower than last year? This I'm going to give you as a percentage. So here you're going to miss by what? Anybody know the words? You miss by what? basis points. Their gross margin was 25%. The expected was 24.9%. You beat by 10 basis points, right? You don't say you beat by a percent because it's in percent. Remember when you're comparing percentages, you talk about basis points. So there you talk about basis points, same thing on net margin. All right, so there's the numbers. So just give me the numbers. Then you have a discussion to explain the numbers. Now, what most students do, I, I've, I've seen it both ways. Some students give me all the numbers and then the discussion. Some students give me earnings and then talk about earnings. Then give me revenue and talk about revenue. Then give me margins, talk about margins. It kind of depends. I think it's a little more cumbersome to do it the latter way. I think you're better off giving all the numbers and then getting into what's, what's going on with the numbers uh, because you're gonna have some overlap. It's hard to talk about earnings per share without talking about revenues and talking about margins. So you're gonna kind of re redundant. So you can look and see what did management say? Now here's a chance for you to do something. It's really boring, but you should do it. If you haven't done this yet, I recommend you do it for this paper. Is that go listen to the earnings call for your firm. How many of you here have never listened to an earnings call in this classroom? Is that the majority of you or some of y'all have? How many of you have listened to earnings call? A few in the back, all right, all the people in the back. All right, so they're boring, aren't they? They just bore you to tears. But the first part's really boring because that's that's the dog and pony show of management. Everything's wonderful. You know, the firm's crashing, about to go out of business, and everything's just wonderful. You know, 
But the exciting part is when the sell side analysts at the end start asking questions. You want to listen to what questions they're asking because these are people who know the firm better than anybody else. You want to hear what are they what are they curious about? What what was really their number? What's their first question? Some of their questions are a little squirrely. Um, Elon Musk had a pretty famous earnings call where he laid into one of the sales analysts for being stupid and kind of made the press. I wouldn't want to bend that sales analyst. So sometimes they don't think, but they are very knowledgeable people and they do tend to ask really good questions. If you don't want to listen to the call, you can get the transcript of the call either from, either from the firm's webpage or Bloomberg has a transcript. A lot of these trans transcripts are computer generated. So um, yeah, I got a call the other day and or two days ago, I think, and I got the transcript and it asked me if I wanted to sell my puppies. And when I listened to call it was properties, you'll get some of the stuff like that. So they'll you'll say like, what? what are you talking about puppies all of a sudden? So you may have to listen to the call to get the true sense of it because the computers don't always transcribe things very, very well. But I highly encourage you, you'd be able to say in an interview that you've listened to a, an earnings an earnings call because it's it's pretty common. That's what we do. Um, if you're on the buy side, you can only listen. If you're on the sell side, you actually get to get in and ask questions and, and challenge management. And then the big part is how did the market react? I'm going to give you some of this. Um, let's say Lowe's reports and they beat on earnings and they're up 4%. That sounds great. But then you look at the stock market and it's up 5%. Oh, wait, did Lowe's have a good day? Well, their, their stock was up 4% and the market's up 5%. Maybe maybe it wasn't all that good. But if they're up 4% and the market's down 2%, then yeah, that, that earnings report is really strong. So you might want to compare, compare them to the market. What else might you want to compare them to? They're a retailer. What other stocks might you want to compare them to? Maybe retail stocks? <laughs> Retail stocks are up 1%, they're up 4%. What if retail stocks are up 12%, which is unlikely, but they're only up 1%. And you say, well, maybe the market didn't love their earnings report all that much. What's one other stock you might compare Lowe's to? One, one company you might compare them to. Home Depot. When you get stocks like JP Morgan and Citibank or Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs or Home Depot and Lowe's, the first one that reports often influences the second one. Because they say, wow, if JP Morgan had good numbers, there's a good chance Citibank is, and you'll see them re them jump up. So if they don't, if Lowe's, we've seen this with CVS and Walgreens, where one goes up and the other one goes down on earnings report. Why? Because CVS did something where they're still in Walgreens market share. Then you see a very different. So those are the three things you probably want to talk about. You know, talk about how the stock did, but how did, the, how did it do versus S&P 500? How did it do versus this industry? And I'll give you all these things. And how did it do versus a key company in the market? But you have to know which day to talk about. That's really critical. You're talking about one day. So you have to know if they reported earnings today, did they report before open or after close? Because that's going to tell you which day you're going to look at. Again, that volume, if you're not sure, look at their historical volumes. The day with the highest volume, that's the day you want to talk about their stock price. Um, I'm actually going to give you that. I'm going to give you a chart off of Bloomberg. I'm going to do all that stuff. But the chart, I'm, the, what I'm giving you, um, I might record it while I'm doing it so you can see how to do it. You should be able to do it yourself. I started doing it because of COVID and I've just kept doing it. But you should be able to do everything I'm doing, bringing all that data. If you're on the dashboard team, we do a lot of that, collecting the data. But teach yourself how to do it. And then what you got to do is you've got to figure out why did the market react that way? So you think if a company beats that their stock price would be up. And if they miss, you expect your stock price to be down. But 40% of the time, it's the exact opposite. 40% of the time, a company will beat and the stock will fall. Or the company will miss and the stock will be up. And so there's something really, really important here called management outlook. Management must say, yeah, we beat. But boy, we're having a tough November. Things are, we're not we're not seeing the numbers we're expecting. You know, Netflix says we're our new subscribers. We're just we're seeing big turnover here somehow. YouTube's getting all our new customers or whatever, or TikTok's killing us, whatever it is, or Disney's um, management outlook. Outlook. So sometimes you'll see they beat, but the stock fell because management said something, or it could be some analyst said something. 
some analysts said, well, this report's not really telling the true story. So the companies I'm looking for are the are the fun ones. So a big, big beat, a big miss. I, usually the stock price moves a bunch, but my favorite ones is when they beat and the stock price falls or they miss and the stock price goes up. Those are the most fun ones to talk about. This is actually a fun paper. I'm actually jealous of you that you get to do this paper because this is a really fun paper to do. If you don't enjoy doing this paper, don't go into the investment world. <laughs> All right, you won't enjoy it. This this is the paper you should enjoy. Um, I mean, you find yourself, right? You're a finance major. You see something like that, a, a stock beat 5% and it's down 10%. If you're a finance major, you got to stop what you're doing and go find that. There's something, wait, why, how did that happen? You you can't go on the, you're, all your friends, they're they're about to fly to Hawaii. You say, y'all go ahead. I got to go watch, uh, watch the news, my stock. So you just get into it. You're, you're captivated by it. All right. So that's the paper. I won't put an example paper online because students do too much copying and pasting. Of other, I don't want to see your own work. I may show you some example papers though in class, but that's what we're going to do. If you have a company you want me to really watch, I can certainly do that. Um, I like to use NASDAQ earnings calendar. Although it's wrong sometimes, it's safe firms are recording earnings that don't. The reason I like NASDAQ is they give the market cap so like now, today, United Health Group, Johnson & Johnson's reporting today, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs. It says they're reporting today. Are they reporting after open, I mean, before open or after close? So if you look at J&J, &J, it looks like they could have, it could have been before open because there's their volumes up high, but we'll see tomorrow. Tomorrow's volume 16 million. We know it's tomorrow. So that's how we're going to be able to, to tell. So we got some good choices in here. I'm looking for a firm that reports and the stock moves 5, 10% or more. So if you have a stock you want me to make a story about and its stock moves 0.3%, that's going to be too boring of a paper to write. You need something. I want you to have an exciting paper to write. All right, I'll stop it there. So, all right. So long-term treasuries, overweight treasuries as weak economy. Oh, actually, before I do that, I'm going to say stocks versus bonds. See if they have that one. Overweight bonds, especially high quality. And avoid our underweight stocks. And how many points do you get if you wrote that? Zero. Why? Because weak economy right you got to tell me why telling me what to do no value to your score unless you tell me why all right so someone's at underweight stocks but doesn't say because of weak economy or recession and it doesn't that doesn't count all right so there's one point there overweight treasuries because the economy is weak overweight long term as rates are falling and they have to be real clear they can't say overweight because weak economy and falling rates. You got to tell me you want the treasuries for weak economy. Um, I mean, I'm not overly picky on that, but but make it make it clear. If they say something, rates are falling and won't more duration, something like that. But yeah, treasuries underweight as inflation falling. Now, y'all know the difference between inflation, deflation, and disinflation? Have y'all been taught that in your eco class? So inflation, prices are rising. Deflation, prices are falling. Disinflation, inflation is falling. It's still positive it's in falling. So here we're talking deflation, actually prices falling. All right, so there's one, two, three, four. You may got four points so far. A few, okay. Um, mortgage backs. Underweight as rates will be volatile, but boy, do I like that spread. If you wanted to say that, you don't have to, but that is an incredibly wide spread for mortgage banks. What's the bond market telling you? The bond market's telling you rates are going to be really volatile. So, I mean, that's that's an incredibly wide spread. 4.2 versus 2.8. Did anybody get tempted by that spread? So 
Don't ign- you remember what I said in here? We we're we're ignoring whether something's overpriced or underpriced. But this market is definitely telling you you're getting paid to take mortgage back risk. But um, okay, corporates and municipals, overweight, high quality with recession, overweight, long term with rates falling between four. And Muni, overweight Muni with tax adjusted yield of 5.97%. Is that what y'all get? Yep. I need to see that 5.97. If they don't have that, then they don't get credit for the tax one. All right. So you have to show this number to get credit for this one. All right. High yield bonds, pretty easy one, underweight with recession, large cap, large cap. What two words I'm gonna say? Within stocks, overweight as the better in recession, low beta, within stocks, overweight with recession. Small cap, underweight. That's not even close. I hate the word weight for some reason. Session, value stocks, underweight. With recession, remember value stocks are low quality. I'll just associate value stocks with high yield bonds. Just think of them being low quality. Developed market, underweight, will be weaker. In the U.S., underweight with strong U.S. dollar. Now, some students put the dollar on emerging. That's not actually technically wrong, but emerging markets are a lot tougher to talk about the dollar than developed. So I prefer it to be on a developed. Emerging underweight as underperform. U.S. Alternatives, overweight, precious metals, given. And here you just have to kind of quote them. Um, As expect significant rise. Underweight commodities as expected be weak. Did someone get get his? Are yeah. you grading someone? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Any 18s in here? Any 17s in here? Oh, I'll add them up. Add them up. I'll, I'll post this one on. Y'all see what we're going to do on Tuesday? Yeah, so I can see it. I got lost halfway through. Okay. All right. So, y'all shouldn't, there should be no surprises on Tuesday. Make sure you're on time on Tuesday. Really important. You come in late, you're going to be short on time because we're stopping at 30 minutes. <laughs> Now, generally, I I don't know, divide by 18. It depends, but the class determines that. I think the last couple of classes I did divide by 18 because classes are starting to do better and better. So, there's nothing on real estate in here, but. I mean, if you talk about something else, you make a valid argument. I won't give you three things for alternatives. So there's no like extra credit. But if you miss one, we get one I didn't think of and it's legitimate. I may give you credit. All right. I will put this on on Canvas. All right. Everybody's clear. So add them up. 
and put the number, the total number somewhere at the top next to the team number so I can put them all together. You might glance at your paper if you think there's some sabotage going on. Um, probably the biggest risk is when a team is grading a team members. So don't don't try to push your scores up. There's an honor system. All right. So on Tuesday, you'll come and we'll do this question at the beginning. You're going to submit question one on Canvas. Question one is a summarizing all these notes we did starting on the middle of page three, but in your own words. So no copy paste or I'll see it. You'll lose a lot of points. Someone was asking, well, can I use the same format? I would pick a different font or something. So it doesn't look like I'm reading my own notes, but um, there will be the plagiarism check, which will catch up on my notes. So put it in your own words. The best way to do it is, well, hopefully you've already done it. You've already got it written, but read each section, listen to the lecture, look at your notes, and then without looking at anything, write it off the top or type it off the top of your head with no notes. That way, you know, it's going to be in, in your own words. Um, so that's question one, and you now know question two. So everybody should make 100 on this exam. I don't know why anybody wouldn't. But um, if you haven't started on question one, you probably won't do well. But if you've started and you've gotten your answer going, you're, you're in good shape. All right. Any questions on the exam? All right, turn those in. I'll take them. Yeah, swap, swap them up. Yeah, bring them all up. Nope. You can keep it. I'm going to put it on Canvas as well, though. No questions about Tuesday? Who's written there? Question one completely and is ready. Anybody? All right. I'm not a big fan of procrastination. I don't think it is of any value. I think some students, their logic is if I get it done early and I get hit by a bus, I would have wasted, you know, the last few days of my life preparing for an exam. But the chance of that happening are extremely low. You're better off. I was a non procrastinator in college and all my all my fellow students hated my guts. I remember we had a major project due and one guy was asking me how it was going. I said, oh, I finished it last week. And boy, that guy could have, he could have killed me. He was so mad at me. And I was like, you know, I didn't do you any harm. What are you so mad about? But he just made him mad. But I don't see any value to procrastination in school or in work. Get ahead of the curve. If I knew how to research paper in a class, I started working on it the first day of class. As, as soon as it was assigned, I started researching it because because it's like, you spread it out, you learn more, you retain more, and you get a much better product at the end. So it's just my philosophy. All right. All right, so we're gonna start talking about return. So, you might think this is pretty straightforward. How did my portfolio do? But actually, the majority of Americans have stocks and they really have no clue how they're doing. Most Americans don't know how to calculate returns. Your 401k plan will give you a return. I don't know how well it's calculated. I don't know if they're using modified deeds or something. Um, calculating return is a lot more complicated than you might think. Um, I'm following the CFA standards when I do portfolios. But there are debates about how you do it, whether it's uh, time value, time weighted or, or dollar weighted. You can get very, very different answers depending on how you calculate it. So it's an important concept. So when someone tells you the return, you really want to know what, how are they doing it? What we're going to do is we're going to simplify it so that you can see the process. But I'll point out some of the issues you've got to know about. Um, when I was at USAA, there was a department that did all USAA return calculations. And nobody wanted this apartment, so they called me and asked me if I'd take them. And I took, I took them all and said, yeah, have them come over here. It didn't make a lot of sense because the, the team that was grading the portfolios was working for me, who was managing the portfolios. So it's like, yeah, I'll take them. Yeah, we'll, we'll do really well going forward. Um, 
but I learned a lot about how complicated this process is, how much data it takes, how much time it takes, and how you need people who are just adamant that it be done correctly. And you watch for gaming because once the portfolio manager knows how their return is, re is calculated, they can actually game the system because there's not an obvious way. I mean, just to give you an example, portfolio manager says, okay, I bought something on Tuesday. Well, the person doing the analysis, they got to know, well, where in the day did he buy it or she buy it? Did, did they buy it at open, at, at midday, at the close? So you'll see these things called BWAP and all these kinds of words, these different average prices. It makes a big difference uh, what they say with, because you're trying to compare it against the benchmark and make a big difference. So it's not as easy as you think, but we're keeping, so keep in mind what we're doing here is pretty simple. You got to do two things with return. The first thing you got to do is come up with a holding period return. So holding period return is some period of time you're going to calculate so that you can start collecting that over time. Most common holding period return is monthly. Okay, most people calculate monthly. That's what we did at USAA was monthly. Uh, but you can do a do daily and link all the dailies, or you can do monthly or quarterly. Real estate, I still talked about real estate tends to do quarterly because they have a lot of appraisals. But monthly is the most common. And so when you do monthly, here's the simplified approach we're going to do. We'll talk about modified deeds here in a second. But you take the ending market value minus the beginning market value plus accrued income divided by the beginning market value. Very, very simple. There's a massive thing that's missing from that. If you look at that next bullet, it ignores whether you bought or sold something on that day or in that month. So how do you handle that? I'll show you how Modified Deeds handles it. Um, modified Deeds is a time-weighted return. Um, it's not a dollar-weighted. I, I use Modified Deeds for our student portfolios. At home, I use dollar weight. So which is better? It depends on what you're doing. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, so the key on the income is this word accrued. It's not when the cash changes hands, it's when it's accrued. For bonds, bonds pay for six months. So every month you're gonna add one sixth of that income when you do the return. So bonds, you accrue that bond income. For stocks, the key date is, so for stocks, we have three dates. We have dividends declared, ex-dividend date, uh, and dividend payment date. So they might say we're gonna on no on September 9th, 15th, they say we're gonna pay a dividend. On October 20th, it goes X. On November 5th, they pay it. So when do you accrue it? Do you accrue it when they declare it? Do you accrue it when it goes X? Or do you accrue it when you go when you pay the dividend? Any guesses? It was on the slide if you're really looking ahead. Which of those three days would you put it in? Yeah, so it's not cash, so it's not going to be payment. That would be less logical for a lot of people as payment date. We don't do that with bonds either. Bonds, you accrue it every single month. So it's actually X date. So what does X date mean? What X date means, let's say a stock's paying a $1 dividend. If you own the stock on X day and you sell it the next day, you're going to still get the $1 dividend. So if you own the stock on X date, you get the dividend, even if you sell it before the payment. And so that's why the X date so more. You, if you have the stock on X date, you've earned that, that dividend, it is yours. All right, so X date's the key. Declare date, they can actually change their mind and I'll pay it on declare date. They're just That's their intention. On X date, there's no going back. Once it's on X date, they're committed, they're gonna pay that dividend. And then the payment date, this is not a big deal from our formula if it all happens in the same month because we're not adjusting for days. But uh, at USA, we did monthly, but we calculate our stock returns using daily data. So it depended when, when in the month. And when I do the student portfolios, I do days. So I look at the X date and that's the date I use to bring in, bring in the timing. So uh, yeah, for accruing income. Um, 
And then the payment date, you got to adjust for it as well. So modified dates, you got to do both. All right. So X date's the key. If you're looking at Yahoo Finance, if it will let me. Socks are up today. What are bonds doing today? What are bonds doing today? Selling off, going up. What do y'all say? Have we y'all forgotten everything you did the first party class? Selling off. Selling off. Is it a big day or a small day? Big. Big. Because that's how many? What is that? Eight, Eight basis points. Why do we say big day was? Six, Six and a half. So pretty big day for bonds, although they've been rallying the last few days. So this is their first update in a few days. So they were coming down. And now they're shooting back up. So I don't know what hit in the news today. Stocks are up today. So it's probably not. Well, they were up. They're down now. Uh, it's probably not inflation related. Because um, bonds are down a bunch. Stocks are kind of flat. So if we look at a stock, look, look at Costco. So Costco. They paid a dividend on July 26. So what date do you think Yahoo Finance is using? The declaration, X, or paid date? What do you think this is? Yes. You might think paid date, but you'd be surprised that it's actually what? This is X date. Why did he use X date? Because on X date, the stock price is going to fall by the amount of the dividend. I mean, not there's other things going on, but the stock should not. You didn't notice that with... Costco, because they had a really big day that day. We'll probably notice it with another one. Let's find one of their massive dividends. It's been a while, though, since they've done that. Um, man, their stock's up every time they pay a dividend. Here we go. Um, yeah, it looks. look at that dividend, $15. So look at that. It went from 74 to 66 and you own Costco and you go, my word, Costco just dropped eight bucks over 1%. But did it really? No, because you got a $15 dividend. All right. So on that day, you lost $8 in stock price, but you got a $15 dividend. So their stock really went up $7 that day. All right. So when you see a stock drop a bunch, so we, we, we owned Choice Motel a few years ago in our student portfolio, and I noticed it dropped 25%. Go, what's going on? Was there some news? And I went and looked. They, they did an unusually large dividend. So the stock actually didn't drop. It was actually up, but you got the dividend. All right. So on X date, the stock will drop. Why? Because if you buy the stock tomorrow, you can get the stock, but you're not going to get the dividend. And that company's got to pay the dividend out. So the company's going to come down by that 15 bucks. So you might buy Costco, but Costco is going to be Costco minus 15 bucks once they pay that dividend. So the stock price comes down. So if you buy the stock tomorrow, you're out of luck. You don't get that dividend. If you sell the stock tomorrow, you're going to get the 15 bucks, even though you don't own it. So Yahoo Finance shows the dividend on dividend date. This is the column you want to look at. So here, here it did work. It went from 723 to 721. The stock dropped, but you got $1.16. This last column, it also dropped, but this last column is actually the adjusted price that's adjusting for dividend, so it doesn't necessarily move. And you notice that with the $15 dividend, this last column, it actually went up because that last column adjusts for the dividend. So it kind of takes it out of the numbers so it doesn't affect it. So you can actually use this last column to get a pretty good return on the stock including dividends just by using that last column. It's a pretty good column. But th this column is the actual close. This is not the actual close. It's the actual close adjusted for the dividend. Um, you can see it's it's about the dividend lower. Um, so Yahoo Finance shows X dividend and they do have the adjustment for the dividend. They also adjust for stock splits and everything else so that this last column gives you a really, really good idea of what's going on with the stock. The problem is they're changing their website you can still download it if you get the right website, but it keeps changing. And I can never tell why I'm getting the old version versus the new version. I got the old version here, but next time I come in, it'll be in the new version. All right. So we're using any market value, beginning market value. If you're doing the month of September, what is your ending market value? 
or during the month of September, what's the ending market value for September? Which day? It's obvious. I'm not tricking you here. September 30th. Why would it not be September 30th if that were a Saturday or a Sunday? All right. So your ending market value is the last business day of the month. Now, here's the trick question. What's the beginning market value? And it's not September 1st. So don't say that. It's not September 2nd. Don't say that. And that might have been a holiday. It's not September 3rd. Don't say that. So what, what is the beginning market value? It's not anywhere on here. What would it be? August 30th. All right. So your beginning market value is the previous ending market value. All right. You don't use the first day of the month. You use the last day, the last business day of the previous month. All right. On the exam, if I try to trick you on that, then make sure you know it's ending market value is the last business day of the month. Beginning is the last business day of the previous month. Does ignore cash flows. All right. So let's look at modified deeds because modified deeds, you can look up modified deeds in Wikipedia. See if I get the Wikipedia commercial here. Yeah. So here's the modified deeds. So here's their formula. Their formula looks a lot different. And the reason their formula is different is what they're trying to adjust out is a time weighted return. And what modified, and this is a proof. This is what you have to do for the CFA. If you're, you're a CFA firm, a certified financial analyst firm, you have to follow modified deeds. It's a time weighted return. What time weighted means is they want the return without the effect of you're doing purchases and sales. Because the argument is you're managing someone else's money. And the fact that they came to you to, on Tuesday with $10 million and right after they sent you $10 million, the market dropped, that's not your fault. They came in with 10 million bucks. So you want to take that timing out. It, their timing is their fault, not your fault. That's what modified deed says. It's a time way to return. So if you come in with 10 million bucks, the market falls 20%. If you come in two days later with 10 million bucks, you'd be a lot high, happier, wouldn't you? You buy everything 20% cheaper. Modified deed says ignore that. It's not the manager's fault that you time the market incorrectly. So remember, it's a time way to return. I don't know if they have that in here. Oh, it's in there 40 times. So, so it's a time way to return and it's a pretty complicated formula. You have to have the, the exact date of every single cash flow. Every dividend, you have to have the dividend payment date as well as the X date. The X date tells you what month you're gonna accrue it to. The payment date is gonna be adjusted for the timing of the cash flows. And you have to put all that in there in a way that the timing of cash flows doesn't affect your return that you calculate. The other type of return is the dollar weighted return. So time weighted. Ignores cash flow timing. And then dollar weighted. Think of dollar weighted as your IRR. You remember IRR? It's what return, if you apply that return, adjusting for time to all of your cash flows, you would get exactly your ending value. It's whatever return gets you. That's the return I care about because that's my, this is your, your true return. So if you're doing your own portfolio, what should you use? You should use dollar weighted. That's what you're actually doing because you, you decided when to go on the stock market. You went on Tuesday and the market crashed 20%. That's your fault. You decided to go in on Tuesday. That's a dollar way to return. Okay. Is there a difference in these two? As uh, Bogle says, over a several year period, this was 40% and this was 0.1%. So is there a difference? And why is there such a big difference? This is the bad timing the retail investors. That's how bad retail investors are. You calculate a return, but ignore when they timed the market, they would have made 40%. When you put in their timing decisions, they made almost nothing. Is that pretty incredible? And what does the market say? Hey, this is how we're graded. Because we didn't tell you when to, when to invest. Why do I say 
you absolutely tell people when to invest. Go look at Fidelity commercials. Go look at T. Rowe Price commercials. What do they advertise? They advertise their best funds. They're advertising the things that are the most expensive. What are they advertising right now? They're magnificent seven funds. They're growth funds. Why? Because those ones are up. I think the market after this, our, I think our profession absolutely does influence timing of cash flows, the way we advertise, the way we market. So I don't take it off the hook, but this is our industry. We advertise that we made our customers 40% when they actually made 0%. And we're real proud of that. How do you get around that? It's we need to market differently. We need to market based on what we know. Don't buy high and sell low. You should buy low and sell high. But we don't. We market what we can sell. What we can sell is usually the worst thing possible because it's the thing that's the most overpriced. But CFA requires a time-weighted return, and that's the modified EATS. I can spell it. It's a time-weighted return. It's required by the, by the CFA Institute. Questions on that? I'm not trying to make you cynical, but just to realize those commercials you see of all these funds, it's, that's what they'd return if their customers' timing was completely indifferent. <laughs> All right, so before we do linking, which is, you know, this is an exam question. Most students get this one right, but we'll see how we can do here. Let's look at Costco and let's calculate their hard return for July. All right. Holding period return. All right, so we need the ending market value, we need the beginning market value. And we need to need the dividend if it's X date. All right. Someone yell out the ending market value. And it's not this column, it's this column. So July, month of July. Sec third to last column. 822. July 31st, 822. Sorry. Did I do that right? Yeah, I was like, where are the pennies? But there are no pennies. All right, what's the beginning market value? Eight forty nine, right? Eight forty nine. It's not July third on June thirtieth. It's June twenty eighth. But eight forty nine ninety nine. Right, so their stock price fell quite a bit. The dividend could influence that. So what's the dividend? Do they have a dividend? So that's the X date, $1.16. All so how did they do? We take any market value minus beginning market value plus accrued income divided by beginning market value so we're going to take 822 minus 849.99 plus 1.16 divided by 849.99 and they were down a little over three percent in july right that is one holding period that we have we're going to calculate a bunch of holding periods we can do three we can do 36 months 60 months 120 months however much time we want to look at them but we need one holding period so we can start looking at a longer period of time. And you need to be consistent on this, but a very simple formula. Not a lot of, not a lot of difficulty there. Let's do the month with a massive dividend. If I can find it, where was it? There it is. All right, let's do there December. All right, what's the ending market value here? Just yell it out. Just yell it out. No one knows. Thanks. Y'all make me so nervous. In the beginning market value. Five ninety two seventy four. 
and then the dividend. So here, boy, they, they must have had an incredible month in December. What's the dividend? 15 bucks, my word, what a month they had. I uh, hear students say, well, obviously I had a good month. It was the holiday season and, and that's when they sell a lot. First of all, this is Costco. This isn't um, uh, some big retailer like, um, I don't know, Macy's or someone. But secondly, to say the reason our stock price is up, it's the holiday season. So obviously consumers are spending would assume the stock market didn't know the holiday season was coming and they were surprised. Do you think stockholders, stock in investors know the holiday season is coming? That they were surprised. Oh, wow, we had a holiday season. People were buying gifts. I've never seen that before. Oh, no, it happened last year. I just wasn't paying attention. No, they know. So don't ever make that argument. Be careful in interviews. Yeah, obviously Costco was up. It was it was a holiday shopping. No, that's not true. The market knows that. They would have gone up in November or September. They wouldn't have gone up already. So maybe what happened is um, there's a change of opinion on retail spending sometime mid-December and, and all retail stocks shut up. Shut up. We saw retail sales today, right, were really strong. So yeah, really, really strong, especially if you take autos out. So maybe that they got a retail sales and it looks like consumers really going to spend that make Costco go up. Who knows? So we got the any market value, the guinea market value, and we got the dividend. So we're going to take 660.08 minus 592.74 plus 15 divided by what? 592. Some students get confused and divided by the ending market value. But they, so they're up 14% in December. That's a pretty good one month. You would have been glad if you bought them on November, whatever, 28th. You would have been pretty excited. Um, all right. So that's a holding period. That's just one month. You can't do much with one holding period. What you got to do is put them together and then you're going to calculate things like standard deviation, alpha or not alpha, but standard deviation, total return, um, beta. Uh, there's all kinds of things we can calculate to, to see what they're doing. But with one month, we can't do much with one month. So what are we going to do with multiple holding period returns? And it depends. We want to get some averages, but... It depends. Do you want an arithmetic average or a geometric average? So ge arithmetic is really easy. You just add the numbers together and divide by n. So if you got three months, you add them together and divide by three. That's easy. That's the equal average function in Excel. That one's a piece of cake. All right. Geometric, you have to actually link them. You have to take one plus the first month. Take all of that, multiply by one times the second month. Essentially what the geometric saying is if you started with $1 and you invested in this, how much would you have at the end of the, your time period? You would just keep reinvesting. Which of these sounds more accurate? Well, the geometric is far more accurate if you're looking at history. So if you're doing your own portfolio, you want to do a ge geometric average. Arithmetic's more accurate if you're forecasting the future. So it depends on what you're doing. I had this huge debate at, at USAA. They want to use geometric averages in a stochastic model. You can't do that. You have to use arithmetic in a stochastic model. And I'll, I'll explain the difference in them. One of these numbers is always, the, always equal or lower than the other one. And that's geometric. Geometric is always, always lower than arithmetic or equal. It can be equal, but it can't be higher. But geometric is so your actual return going forward. Arithmetic is your best estimate going forward, especially if you're going to do a stochastic model. All right? That gives you a monthly average. So if you have 10 months and you take the average, that gives you your month, monthly average. If you do 30 months, that's your average for 30 months. But most of us like to see numbers on an annual basis. We like to annualize these numbers. Again, arithmetic is real simple. Once you get your monthly number, you just multiply by 12 because there's 12 months in a year. So you get your arithmetic average for the monthly numbers, multiply by 12, that's your annual number. All right? If you're doing weekly returns, then you take your weekly average, multiply by 52. So arithmetic is the easiest one to deal with. It can give you some pretty skewed numbers, you can see. Um, but arithmetic is what we use when we're forecasting something into the future. What is the geometric average annualized? You take your geometric average before you subtract one, and you raise it to the number of periods in a year over, over n. So if you're doing 30 months, your geometric average 
is one plus each period raised to the one over 30 minus one. But if you want to annualize it, you do all of that, but instead of raising it to the one over 30, you raise it to the 12 over 30. All right, we're going to practice a lot with this, so you'll see how, how it works. So why are the geometric and arithmetic averages different? They're different because of standard deviation. Standard deviation pulls geometric averages down. And why is that? I'll show you real quickly here. Let's say your uncle says, invest some money for me. I'll give you 100,000 bucks. You took this investment class. Obviously, you know what you're doing. And you, you invest for two months. And the first month, you make 50%. And the second month, you lose 50%. So how much does he have at the end of month one? You made 50%. 100,000 times one plus 50,000. Have 150,000. That sounds good. Your uncle, how is, how's your uncle thinking right now? Pretty happy. What do you have the next month? 150,000 and you, you make one plus minus 50%. What do you have now? 75,000. What is your uncle thinking now? But you say, wait, uncle, I got an arithmetic average. My arithmetic average is 50% plus minus 50% divided by two. So uncle, I, I made I made 0%. And what is your uncle thinking? All right, I gave you 100,000 bucks. I have 75,000 bucks and you say you made zero. And you can, his next question is what school do you go to? Are you going to A&M? What is it? So I don't get this. What's the geometric average? Well, the geometric average says take the holding period return. One plus 50% times one plus minus 50. You link them. You're going to take all of that and raise it to what? How many periods do we have? Two. So one over two and minus one. Say, hey, uncle, I lost you 13%. For, that's my average, 13% per month. Which of these sounds more likely? I lost, I made 0% or I lost 13.4% on average. Which would your uncle buy? He'd probably buy the negative 13%, don't you think? Um, how do you, how can you tell if that's the case? You take 100,000 times one plus negative 13%. You take 86,000 times one plus negative 13. What do you think you'll get at the end? 75,000 bucks. Do you see why the geometric makes sense for your own personal portfolio when you're looking historically? Because that's what you're actually getting. But if your uncle wants an estimate for the third month, what would be his best estimate for the third month? Would it be 0% or negative 13%? 0% would be his best estimate. So for a forecast, so you can say, uncle, you, you lost 13% a month, but our expected value for next month is zero. We think we'll make you nothing next month. And that would be intelligent, probably not enough for your uncle. He'll probably take his money back, but that would be good finance. All right. So that's the difference between arithmetic and geometric. And the difference in them, and this is a good formula to know, the arithmetic is the, the geometric equals the arithmetic minus, minus half the standard deviation squared. If it's a normally distributed distribution, if it's not normally distributed, you can get a different answer. All right, so the arithmetic is lower. Why? Because of risk. Why was your uncle's portfolio's arithmetic and geometric averages so different? Because it was really volatile. The more volatile it is, the more difference you're going to see between those two. In fact, this is a good way to test if a portfolio you're looking at, if its monthly returns are normally distributed, if the geometric equals the arithmetic mass minus half the volatility, then it's probably a pretty normally distributed uh, distribution. All right. So that's the difference between arithmetic and geometric. I didn't annualize this, but if you annualize this, you take that monthly average times 12. Here, you would take this, but you would raise it to the 12 over two. Then you get a really massive number, all right? So we'll, we'll practice on this more and more and more. Um, so, uh-huh. I don't understand why the arithmetic is better forecast in the future. As, you just have to trust me on that. 
if you use this in a stochastic model with this standard deviation, you'll end up with a you'll end up with a geometric average that looks exactly like this. Because standard deviation negatives are going to bring it down more than positives are going to bring it up. So if you run a stochastic model with the arithmetic average, but with that standard deviation, you will actually end up with the correct geometric average. I have to show you with math to show you, but just trust me. All right.